Hello and welcome to West Virginia Press Insight, a production of the West Virginia newspaper industry. I'm Tom Hunter. And I'm Betsy DeBoer. Like you, we're interested in issues impacting West Virginia. West Virginia Press Insight focuses on policy and impact, not politics or personalities. Today we're looking at the following issues. West Virginia teachers and the promise of a bigger pay raise, legislation still alive in the final days of the legislative session, high profile legislation that died this session, and regulations for Airbnb type lodging in West Virginia. In our WVU Today segment, we look at a program that allows high school students to track WVU scholarship earning potential through a new online platform. And we'll look at tourism in the scenic New River and Greenbrier Valley. And in our in-depth segment with Don Smith, West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association Executive Director Ann Blankenship talks about legislation dealing with co-tenancy in West Virginia's natural gas industry. Governor Jim Justice and representatives from state teachers and service personnel unions announced a tentative deal to end a statewide strike after five days. But the plan met with resistance almost immediately after it was announced February 27th. Some legislators questioned the funding for a 5% pay increase, and some teachers said the proposal didn't do enough to address PEIA concerns. Schools in all 55 counties remained closed even after the announcement. Union membership was still questioning the plan, and county school officials were trying to ensure there would be adequate staffing on the job when schools do reopen. Governor Justice told a crowd that during his statewide education tour last week, a sixth grader reminded him that teacher pay raise would be an investment. The governor said that caused him to meet with his revenue expert, who determined that the estimated collections for this year could be increased by $58 million. That's the money Justice pledged to use toward the pay hike, and union officials said they would go back to work while details were being finalized. Those details got a little more difficult than anticipated, however, with more than one group. Senate President Mitch Carmichael said that he was concerned about the sudden bump in revenue estimates and would have to closely examine Justice's plan. Now, many teachers, on the other hand, said a commitment to create a task force to look at ways to help PEIA fell short of the assurances they wanted that the insurance program would be fixed for the long term. On what was supposed to be a cooling off day before students went back to school, thousands of teachers returned to the state capitol on Wednesday, February 28th to express their frustration. You know, Tom, Bishop Nash reported in the Logan Banner on memories of the first time teachers walked off the job in the state's history. That was an 11-day strike in 1990, with 47 counties voted to walk out. And Betsy, this time, of course, has been very much different because teachers represented by both the WVEA and AFT West Virginia walked out statewide in addition to school service personnel. That shut down schools in all 55 counties, leading to the development of the social media hashtag 55 Strong. Of course, having hashtags is another big difference when comparing the 2018 walkout to 1990 as social media has played a major role in this movement. And one similar aspect to the two strikes Nash noted is that thousands of teachers showed up to rally at the Capitol. In both instances, the state's attorney general, Patrick Morrissey this time, and Roger Tompkins in 1990 called the work stoppage illegal. No teachers lost their jobs during the first walkout, however. And we'll have to see what the next chapter is this time as negotiations related to PEIA are sure to continue well beyond the legislative session that ends Saturday night, March 10th. Time is running out on the West Virginia legislative session. We are now into the month of March and past the 50th day, or crossover day as it's known, when all legislation has to be passed out of its chamber of origin. Always a hectic day at the Capitol, this year Crossover Day also featured protests and discussion of the teacher pay raise issue. As of March 1, when 10 days remained in the session, the legislative website noted Governor Jim Justice had signed 20 pieces of legislation into law, 12 Senate bills, and 8 House bills. The most discussed of those include Senate Bill 267, giving teachers, service personnel, and state troopers a 2 1 1 percentage salary increase. However, that issue is being readdressed by House Bill 4145, which gives a 3-2% increase. Other notable bills signed by the governor include Senate Bill 263, eliminating state film tax credits. Also, House Bill 2546, allowing replacement costs of employer-provided property to be deducted from an employee's final paycheck if the property is not returned. In the West Virginia House of Delegates, 175 bills have advanced on to the Senate for further consideration. That list includes those bills that have completed the legislative process. Notable House bills include House Bill 4187, the Business Liability Protection Act, 
requiring private businesses to allow employees and visitors to have guns and vehicles parked on the employer's private property. House Bill 4035, creating a legislative coalition to study and report to the legislature on the issue of palliative care in the Mountain State. House Bill 2655, defining and establishing the crime of cyberbullying. House Bill 2696, developing a program for commercial sponsorship of rest areas in West Virginia. House Bill 4002, establishing 100 single-member delegate districts after completion of the 2020 United States Census. House Bill 4005, making court appeals to the Supreme Court a right. House Bill 4014, reorganizing the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources. House Bill 4268, Co-Tenancy Modernization and Majority Protection Act, which among other items, reduces the number of agreeable owners needed for leasing on attractive land from 100 to 75 percent. House Bill 4345, which increases the number of permits that may be issued for medical cannabis growers, processors, and dispensaries of medical cannabis. This bill also permits a grower to be a processor and dispensary. House Bill 4424, applies the West Virginia Ethics Act to volunteers providing services without pay to state elected officials. House Bill 4558, which allows the West Virginia Development Office to support entrepreneurship, creation of business startups, improvements in workforce participation, and attracting individuals to relocate to West Virginia. In the West Virginia Senate, 229 bills have advanced to the House. Notable bills include Senate Bill 284, which allows for free community college tuition with certain requirements. Senate Bill 360, which would eliminate post-production expenses, such as transportation or severance taxes from royalty owners' checks. Senate Bill 415, permitting wagering on certain professional or collegiate sports events authorized as West Virginia Lottery sports wagering activities. Senate Bill 432, making the Municipal Home Rule Pilot Program a permanent state program open to all municipalities. Senate Bill 341, the West Virginia Appellate Reorganization Act of 2018, which creates the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Senate Bill 494, which would consider members of state teachers' retirement systems absent while serving as an officer with a statewide professional education association. This bill would, in effect, remove educators who are serving as union leaders from the retirement system during their tenure working in the union. Senate Bill 595, creating the Protect Our Right to Unite Act, which prohibits governmental bodies from requesting member information from nonprofit associations. A total of 62 resolutions have completed legislative action. Among the highlights are House Resolution 7, which urges federal policymakers to support the development of an Appalachian storage hub, House Joint Resolution 103, calling for an amendment to start electing members of the West Virginia Board of Education. Senate Joint Resolution 3, the Judicial Budget Oversight Amendment, which addresses the state Supreme Court budget. And Senate Joint Resolution 12, which would require a statewide vote to amend the West Virginia Constitution, clarifying that there is no constitutional right to abortion. And Betsy, with just days left in the session, legislators certainly have a lot to consider talk at the state capitol in these final days is that the teacher strike has sucked much of the air out of the building throughout the 60-day session and legislation did not move at its normal pace. And you know Tom, others said some legislation was held in committee longer to avoid floor discussion when the focus was on finding funds for teacher salary increases. And while many bills are considered dead, we must remember other bills are considered as potential vehicles to resurrect those dead bills. There have been many cases in the past when language from a dead bill is inserted into another bill even after crossover day and then that bill will pass into law. Some pieces of legislation that were considered high priority ticket items when the session started apparently aren't moving anywhere this year. The governor's Just Cut Taxes and Win or JCTAW amendment introduced in two related resolutions, House Concurrent Resolution 106 and Senate Concurrent Resolution 9 has not yet moved. However, we still have to deal with the budget and a possible special session. Faced with the need for funds for teacher salaries, the JCTAW amendment has gotten little discussion. Senate Bill 270 and House Bill 4182, authorizing a management plan for state parklands, including timbering, 
also appears to be dead. Well, some pieces of legislation that were considered high priority when the session started apparently aren't moving anywhere this year. The governor's Just Cut Taxes and Win, or JCTAW amendment, introduced in two related resolutions, House Concurrent Resolution 106 and Senate Concurrent Resolution 9, has not yet moved. However, we still have to deal with the budget and a possible special session. Based with the need for funds for teacher salaries, the JCTAW amendment has gotten little discussion. Senate Bill 270 and House Bill 4182 authorizing a management plan for state park lands, including timbering, also appears to be dead. The plan to timber in state parks drew immediate criticism. Even after being amended to just one park, the bill could not gain traction this session or get out of committee. Senate Bill 600, allowing some manufacturers to negotiate cheaper electricity rates with utilities, died last week on the Senate floor on the third reading. Proponents said the bill would have encouraged companies that use a lot of power to locate or expand in West Virginia. Senator Ryan Ferns, a Republican from Ohio County, said more companies could have lowered power rates for all residents. Consumer groups expressed concerns over the legislation, saying residential customers would have to make up the discounts for industrial customers with no guarantee of attracting new companies. Senator Doug Facemeyer, a Democrat of Braxton County, said asking the people of West Virginia to subsidize industrial power rates now is not the answer. In supporting the bill, Commerce Secretary Woody Thrasher said West Virginia used to be able to promote low electric rates as a reason to do business in the state. Now, he says, West Virginia is in the middle of the pack and some major users could go elsewhere if they can't negotiate better rates. It was noted in all discussions that residential customers and other consumer groups weren't represented in negotiations related to the origin of the bill. Betsy, this has been a very controversial legislative session with a lot of public input, a lot of public debate on bills. And while proponents say it's not the case, many pieces of legislation are being labeled as benefiting either industry or taxpayers, but not both. And important to note, it is an election year that can have an impact upon views on legislation. We've heard the chance around the Capitol throughout the session. Remember in November, the state park logging and the industrial property tax repeal both failed. Those were items that Governor Justice, of course, at the beginning of the session had made a priority. And Senate Bill 600 was just one of a number of bills this session that aims to increase the state's business base. Many of those bills have struggled because it has become an industry versus taxpayers session. With more and more people turning to websites such as Airbnb for short-term stays, one West Virginia city is trying to decide whether the practice should be more closely regulated. Josephine Mendez reports in the Herald-Dispatch that Huntington City Council is considering a new ordinance that has drawn mixed reactions already. At issue are zoning laws that say short-term stays aren't allowed in residential areas. Under the proposed ordinance, that would be defined as fewer than 30 days. It also would require owners to get a business license and pay the appropriate taxes, including a 6% hotel or motel tax. Proponents say they want to protect the rights of property owners who don't want commercial traffic near their private homes. And opponents say the strict regulation will strangle the increasingly popular and growing business, which is helping Huntington become more progressive. Websites such as Airbnb allow people to book a room or an entire house online for a night, a week, or more. One property owner who spoke at a city meeting recently say most of their states are short term and they wouldn't be able to operate with a 30 day minimum. Another homeowner said he didn't move into his neighborhood to live next to a hotel. And Betsy, according to Mendez, an Airbnb official says that there were 30 hosts in Huntington as of December 31st. More than half of those are women. And Huntington appears to be one of the first cities in the state to try to address this issue in such a significant way. Although with the growing popularity, it won't be a surprise if others do so soon. Yeah, Fayetteville took on the issue in 2016. An official there says most rentals are in residential areas, and the only problems have been related to parking. Fayetteville also requires owners to have a business license and pay hotel motel taxes. Huntington City Council will be looking at the issue in the coming weeks, and we'll see what happens. West Virginia University's new Raise Me program allows high school students to calculate potential scholarship dollars and assess their college options earlier. In our WVU Today segment, April Call takes a look. I'm April Call and I'm here today with Stephen Lee, the Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management at West Virginia University. Stephen, thank you for being with us. We're here today to talk about a new exciting program designed to help high school students learn more about college accessibility 
and fill their parents in as well. Yes, so we've decided to partner with a company called Raise Me, and their platform is built around helping students throughout their middle and high school years get ready for college by taking certain actions that will help them to prepare for college, take the right courses, engage in the right activities, so that along the way they're incentivized to stay on a path uh, to be able to actually realize their college dream. Walk me through, if I'm an average student, what am I going to see when I go to the website? Once they make the profile for themselves, they can then record actions they've done while in high school and start to earn micro scholarships. And so students are able to see in real time how they are taking the right actions that we know, based on all of our research, will lead them towards college success. The focus is on helping students to plan for college and make sure that they stay on track and help their parents and guidance counselors and everybody else who's going to be working with them to encourage those students to use a tool that's going to lead them to a success. That website is admissions.wvu.edu slash raise dash me. Stephen, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us about this new Raise Me program, and we encourage people to get more information about it and everything happening at West Virginia University anytime at wvutoday.wvu.edu. Betsy, students can earn dollars toward micro scholarships by participating in activities like taking AP courses. WVU awards over $433 million annually in financial aid, including $48 million in scholarships. Students can visit admissions.wvu.edu slash raise me to learn more about the free program. Welcome to In-Depth. I'm Don Smith and today we're talking with Ann Blankenship, Executive Director of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, about legislation dealing with co-tenancy in West Virginia's oil and natural gas industry. Ann, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And today's a big day. Uh, the bill on co-tenancy is in the Senate today. Uh, it's moving through. But this has been a bill that has been back and forth of, in, a, in a contentious session with some controversy. Co-tenancy has drawn attention from areas outside of the oil and gas industry. The governor talked about uh, possibly asking the Senate to veto it for other issues. Uh, but in the 50 days of the session so far, there's been a lot of support and a lot of interest in co-tenancy from all, all sides. Um, where do you see the bill today? And then we'll talk a little bit about how it got to where it is. So wh what's your feeling with the bill? Are, are you comfortable where you are? Well, as I sit here right now today, I think we're in good shape. We've uh, made a lot of progress. It just passed through Senate Judiciary and is on um, on cue for first reading today on the Senate side. Of course, it started on the House side. Uh, we're very hopeful that we will um, see it through on the Senate side without any amendments, so that won't, we won't have to send it back over and uh, then await the governor's signature. So uh, it has been a lot of ups and downs, recently almost on a daily basis. Right. Um, so, so we're glad that today we're sitting here awaiting first reading on the Senate floor, um, and hopefully we're at the end of this very long journey that we've taken to get here. Well, I think that's part of it, too, the, the long journey. I want to talk a little about that because um, as I, in the committee hearings on this bill and the discussion on this bill, the stakeholders involved in this, uh, the royal, royalty owners, the other groups, your group, all seem to be pretty comfortable. Tell us how you got to that point. How long have you been working this bill to get it in the form it's in now? Right, so this, this bill, the form that it's in now, it represents years of negotiation between a number of different interested parties. So obviously this bill is, is, uh, uh, deals with property rights and mineral owners. So the other stakeholders that I often refer to include the Farm Bureau, the Royalty Owners Association, the Surface Owners Association, and the Land and Mineral Owners Association. So those are sort of the, the, the few main key stakeholders that we often refer to. Um, as you can imagine, in the beginning of this process of trying to come up with something, we were not all on the same page. Um, a version of this bill was uh, making its way through the session last year, Senate Bill 576. A part of it was co-tenancy. It was actually a much larger bill and included other things. But um, we started on the Senate side last year and had a number of stakeholder meetings. And that really, I think, is the, was the beginning process to focus just on co-tenancy and work out those issues with the other stakeholders. And here we are now with a bill that I don't think any of the stakeholders would agree that it's a perfect bill for any of them. 
but in a true negotiation scenario, you know that you have worked hard to get something that everybody can sort of join hands with when no one's 100% happy, right? Because we've all been giving and we've all been compromising. So it's not a perfect bill at all, but I think the great story about it is we have these other stakeholder groups that not only support the bill, they are um, on board with it and they are talking about it and, and they're asking that it pass. Uh, so we're really in a great situation and it's a great story, I think, for um, for the industry and those stakeholder groups and our legislators that have pushed so hard to um, reach you know, a level that they thought was fair and think it's fair for all parties, and I think we're at that point. Good. I want to come back and talk a little bit about how frustrating it must be that when you get a bill to a point that everybody that's involved thinks it's good that it, there are changes and amendments. But uh, I, I, points you made, I've been at the Capitol following this for years, and one of the things that's interesting is that you bring a bill in, and sometimes a bill comes and moves through in one session, but a bigger, more complicated bill, you get a couple sessions, maybe it's presented a forum and it changes the next year, and you get to see where the problems are. Maybe sometimes people who aren't, you don't even realize would have a concern, have a concern. And then the third year, or the second year, third year, you're able to get it worked out. So you're pretty much saying that, that it's been a learning process and that's where you got to where you are today. Absolutely, and I think you make a good point. I don't think with any large piece of legislation uh, that it ever normally goes through during the first time it's brought up at a session because it does take a number of years. We have a short session with only 60 days uh, to try to get a lot done. But, um, you know, we're, we're very close and we're just sort of uh, hunkering down and hoping we can push it through these last few days. And those bills that do go through, those are often the ones that we end up finding problems with later. Someone was left out and there's an right. issue. So I'm glad that your bill is where it is and has been worked on the way it has been worked on. Uh, that being said, the biggest issue at this session so far has been the, the teacher salary situation, the strike and trying to work that out. And as people have looked for revenue to make that happen, uh, the oil and gas industry has been brought up a lot. Um, Co-tenancy is something that you've been working on for three years to get through and you've got all the stakeholders at the table agreeing this is a good piece of legislation. Uh, is there concern and frustration when you hear amendments that aren't necessarily related or germane to the bill being in the term that we like to hear at the Capitol was Christmas treat in or put in? Is that a concern you have or are you pretty confident you can get through where you're at, at this point? It's absolutely a concern. You never know what's going to happen, especially when a bill is, is on the floor to be read for amendments. There are always surprise amendments that pop up. Um, there's, there's a number of changes in the bill now that are, that are concepts that were brand new to us, even going into a committee hearing. I mean, there's some that we knew would probably be proposed. Um, so there's always that concern that something will uh, be added to the bill or a proposed amendment will pop up that, that's not germane or that um, will obviously maybe not be in our interest for the oil and gas industry. But I think even more important for us now is that we maintain this balance that we have. If we start, it's been such a long process to get to the point where we're all in agreement and we're on a tightrope. I mean, if that gets thrown off even a little bit, then the bill could easily die, um, not only with pushback from other stakeholders, but, you know, crossing it back over to the House side if there are amendments and risking, um, you know, an uncertainty on that end. So we're all, I think when I say all, the, the stakeholders are in agreement um, that we really want to keep it where it is. Again, not a perfect bill for any of us, but good enough um, and would do great, great things for the oil and gas industry, for the state of West Virginia, for the mineral owners as well. Um, so I, I think we're just really trying to hold tight and stay on that tight rope at this point and not shake that balance that we've worked so hard to get to. Oh, great. And the oil and gas industry has a rich history going back a century, more than a century in West Virginia. But this current phase of the development in the industry with uh, the gas that uh, is the boom that we're having, it's still really in an infancy and in getting things like this taken care of. How important is that when we look at the industry overall in terms of people investing in West Virginia and development of industry down the line, how important is it for West Virginia and for your association and other associations to get these type of things worked out before uh, we ask major investors to come in and look at locate, locating a plant or a cracker or something here. Is that part of the process? Absolutely. It's a great question and it's so important. It's, it's not only is it important, it's, it's crucial. It's necessary. 
There are so many investment opportunities uh, for West Virginia that are all related to the natural gas that we're sitting on. You know, we're on, on top of the Marcellus and Utica Shales, which represent one of the largest natural gas reservoirs in the world. Um, and it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, if we can't access the gas, then obviously we won't be able to take full advantage of all the downstream opportunities. The natural gas industry is a very dynamic industry. You've got the production, the midstream sector of it, which processes and fractionates and separates the different components of the natural gas that comes out of the ground. And then you've got the pipeline and transmission section. And then at the end of the day, you've got all of these downstream uses that we're starting to hear about um, that will keep that natural resource here and create thousands of jobs and really be a game changer for West Virginia. So obviously that's one of the reasons why we need co-tenancy. Uh, part of that, and another reason, is that we are not competitive with our surrounding states right now that are also on the Marcellus and Utica shales, namely Pennsylvania and Ohio. They have laws in place that address uh, the situation that we're trying to fix with co-tenancy, and we can talk about that a little bit if you'd like um, in more detail. Uh, but those other states are drawing in the production companies and the drillers because they're basically, you know, a more friendly environment for those folks to come in, and we are behind right now as far as increases in production. Um, so if this okay. state want, wants to succeed, we have to have that legal framework in place to be able to allow us to do that. Well, I, I know in West Virginia you can't get anyone to agree to it everyone to agree to anything. But uh, you talk about being friendly, and I know there are a lot of people uh, who are excited about this. And in, and in full disclosure, I should say that while I don't personally have any property with gas, my, there are members of my family that do, and there are members of my family who have property where there is no gas. But I would think that you would love, a friendly environment's important for an investor or a company considering coming here, but a stable environment. If you know what you're dealing with, whether it's the laws, co-tenancy, the taxes, if you can look at that and say, this is a situation, I can do projections right. ahead, that's got to be a key. Absolutely. That's what companies look at when they're looking where to invest in a specific state. They're asking questions. They want to know about the regulatory environment, the legal environment, what the laws stay on the books so that we know what to expect coming in and for years to come. And one of the questions the oil and gas production companies ask is whether or not the state has something like co-tenancy or co-tenancy in place in situations where you can't get all of the mineral owners to agree to development in order to put tracks together so you can get that unit form to drill. Um, and right now the answer to that question is no, and it's put us at a disadvantage. Well, I, th I think we want to talk just a little bit about the, the exact bill itself and the language. Uh, it's House Bill 4268, if you're out there and you want to look and see what the bill includes. But it does give minority owners consideration but instead of being 100% in support of leasing the property, the track, it brings it down to 75% of the owners agree that they can go ahead, correct? That's right. Now, how does that compare? You mentioned other states. Uh, is that similar to what we see in other states? Actually, that is the highest threshold in the country for any sort of co-tenancy law. Really? So, yes. So uh, most laws are at least 50%, but anywhere between 50% and a supermajority, which would be two-thirds. Um, so if this passes, it will be the highest threshold out there in the country for co-tenancy. Um, but we do, we, you know, my members, the, the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, and I believe um, IOGA as well, we're, we're comfortable with the 75%. Uh, I think that really addresses the bulk of the problem. And again, the issue is, the reason why we need this, uh, right now in West Virginia, it requires 100% of your mineral interest owners' approval in order to uh, produce the oil and gas. And that's an issue because especially in West Virginia, there can be hundreds of mineral interest owners in a single tract of land. And as you right. can imagine, very difficult to even locate all of them. And there's often instances where there's gonna be someone that's just not interested in, um, in dealing with the production company or wanting to um, allow or sign for a lease. Uh, and so that situation, we're basically um, not allowed to proceed in that certain tract of land. So what co-tenancy does is it looks at each individual tract of land that would form a unit uh, for a production company to, um, to develop. And uh, if there's 75% of the mineral interest owner's approval, then the oil and gas company can, can proceed. And I think a key point to this is that it's not just about oil and gas uh, companies versus a non-consenting co-tenant, that's the term that we use in the bill. Mm -hmm. It's about all of the mineral interest owners. 
if you don't allow that that majority, that 75% to decide what to do with it, then that majority is not getting, you know, able, that, that really is taking away their right to be able to produce the mineral that they own and reap the benefits from that. And there have been, and there are a lot of people benefiting from this around West Virginia in the area, a lot of people counting on that. So this, again, does take into consideration if the majority of people, 26% don't want it, that won't happen, but it does give the 75% the right to control their own property and their own resources. Right, and then one of the things I mentioned earlier about this not being a perfect bill, um, there are, the bill started out, I think, as a three-pager, um, and it has, and that might have been last year's version, but it's grown, I think maybe 18 pages now, so there are, uh, and the, the bulk of that represents, gives um, to the non-consenting uh, co-tenant. So they are treated very, very well. And of course, this is the, uh, represents that 25% that, that doesn't agree to move forward. Um, they, are rec they are treated as well as the highest uh, treated, best paid uh, royalty owner that's leased in the tract. Um, and there are a number of concessions in place um, to protect them and to make it fair for them. Um, and, and those were the concerns in the, of our stakeholders and part of the reason why it's taken us to get here is to make sure that those folks are treated fairly um, and really treated better than, than most in the, in the tract. So, so while they, you may not be happy with the bill, as Ann's pointed out, it's not perfect, but you are being treated as well as, can, as you can be treated. And I know that Wavonga has information on its website and out there about the bill and about the explaining this. Ioga, West Virginia has information out. So if people want more, they can visit your websites. Uh, the bill hope, well, I know in your case, hopefully we'll be moving through the legislature and we'll find out more about it uh, and see where it ends up. But thank you for being on the show and talking about it, explaining where it is and what we can look forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Next on West Virginia Press Insight, Betsy DeBoer looks at tourism around the New River and Greenbrier Valley. West Virginia is full of wonderful tourism attractions, and the Places to Go section of the Office of Tourism's website, go2wv.com, provides details on destinations in nine travel regions. From outdoor recreation to culture and history, the scenic New River and Greenbrier Valley have a lot to offer. Visitors flock to the New River Gorge to enjoy whitewater rafting and rock climbing, while the Greenbrier Valley is home to the world-famous Greenbrier Resort. From Tamarack, the best of West Virginia's shopping and exhibit center, to a Beckley Exhibition coal mine, the offerings are varied. Hawk's Nest State Park, New River Gorge Bridge, the Greenbrier Bunker, once a top secret fallout shelter during the Cold War, and historic Bramwell. During West Virginia's first coal boom, the community was home to the most millionaires per capita in the United States. In West Virginia's New River and Greenbrier Valley, there is so much to see so close to home. I think a lot of things surprise people coming to Lewisburg. We have a variety of different levels of restaurants and shopping and outdoor activities, and they all kind of work together. With the arts, we've got Carnegie Hall, we get some great productions coming through the Greenbrier Valley Theater. I think that live performance is making a comeback. The audience feels like they're a genuine part of the moment. More and more people want to be in the moment. Every single shop downtown is open all week long. Each shop is unique and diverse to its own unique culture. Within all these little hills and hollers that we have, we have tremendous people creating art. Our mission for Harmony Ridge Gallery is American-made arts and crafts. My medium that I work in is upcycled aluminum cans. I take trash and turn it into treasure. I think that's what people look for when they make a purchase. You want to know that there aren't a million of them out there. They want it to be unique to them. They want it to be something special. A lot of people take pride in this area and they want to refurbish these old buildings and bring them back. Anything that's giving that intention, care, is going to, it's going to feel really good. Tolkien Spa offers conventional uh, spa services. We do offer halotherapy in the salt room. It is a room with 16,000 pounds of Himalayan salt. It helps with respiratory conditions and immune deficiencies. One of the more unique things is the food. It's something that's always evolving. Restaurants are fabulous. We love to go out to eat. <laughs> we buy a baguette every day from the Greenbrier Valley Baking Company. We have 
wonderful French cuisine. Culinary tradition of the of Lewisburg and the Greenbrier Valley really started with the Greenbrier Hotel and the apprentice program that was developed there under some of the master chefs that have, have gone before. That really raised the bar for the area. We have craft beer, we have a smooth ambler, it's a distillery, and now they're making hard cider at Hawk Knob. Cider should really be quite dry. Most of the commercial ciders that are out there are pretty sweet. Our ciders, they're dry, they're complex. There's a lot going on in them. Cider, obviously, is a very traditional American beverage. This is part of our Appalachian heritage here. I'd love to see it come back. When you come here, you truly feel like you just walked back home. Everybody wants to be a part of this. You walk down the street and everyone welcomes you as if you've lived here for 30 years, even if you've just been here for 12 hours.